this. So we've basically finished mitosis before the exams. I've just talked to you about reading the cancer fact file that I've put on Google Classroom. Um, and there, it also mentions the checkpoints and cancer in your, in your notes handout as well. But look, if we can go to uh, meiosis, which is in that handout that we had been working through. So you've heard of meiosis and you've heard of meiosis in fifth form. Um, whenever you were learning about production of sperm and gametes. So your cells have got 46 chromosomes. But in the ovaries and the testes, when these cells divide, they will make sperm cells that have 23 chromosomes. Each cell will divide to form four sperm cells. Okay, or if it's in the case of the ovaries, you'll get four egg cells with half of the, the number. So this type of cell division is called meiosis. Some people call it meiosis. Meiosis, and it's what's called a reductive type of cell division because you're going from cells with 46, in the case of humans, to cells with 23 chromosomes. Or you're, you're producing cells with half of the normal chromosome number. Now, the normal chromosome number is called the diploid. We describe those as being diploid cells. What do we call these ones here that have half of the number? Haploid, okay. Now, it's essential because if a sperm cell had the normal number, and if the egg cell also had the normal number, the fertilized cell would end up with how many? 246s? 92. And that wouldn't work. So we need meiosis to give us a constant number of chromosomes in the life cycle. So it says it's necessary in sexually reproducing organisms to, to maintain the, the constancy of chromosome number. Okay, and it produces haploid cells. And sometimes, you know, they'll talk about haploid cells having N chromosomes. So, you know, in MAD, we'll talk about A and B and N, sort of in algebra. So, N is the haploid number. So, in the case of, of humans, N is 23. And all other cells are diploid. So, diploid cells have 2N. Which, in, in humans, 2N is 46. So it's reductive division, as we said. It halves the number of chromosomes, so therefore it's used to produce gametes, sperm cells, egg cells, and so on. So that, as we said, whenever a sperm fertilizes an egg cell, you end up with a, a zygote, which only has the normal 46 chromosomes. Um, so it can only occur in diploid cells. All of your body cells are diploid. The only ones that aren't are sperm or egg cells. And in the text there, it talks about homologous chromosomes. If we were to look at a picture of your chromosomes, the chromosomes are only visible when they're dividing. And so you've got a chromosome and it's copy or a pair of chromatids. So you will have chromosomes sort of lined up like this. They don't line up like this in your cell in order, but geneticists can put them in a certain order. They know what shape they are and they talk about chromosome number two, chromosome number six and so on. You would have 23 of these pairs. One you got from your father and one you got from your mother. And if this chromosome here codes for eye color, the other homologous chromosome will also code for eye color. Now, one, you might have got the blue eye 
Jean or Aliel from your, your dad and the brown Aliel from your mum, but they're both eye colour jeans. Maybe this one here is coding for whether you've got a sticky out nose or whether you've got a flatter nose and it'll be the same on the other homologous chromosome. Homologous means similar. It doesn't mean exactly the same. It means similar. They have the same genes, but not necessarily the same alleles. Did you learn about alleles last year? No, I don't think you did. That's something we'll do in genetics next year. Okay, so meiosis is divided into eight, eight stages, but there's really two types of division and we'll see that the cell actually divides twice. One cell splits into two and then each of those splits into two, giving us four altogether. So there's basically two divisions. Um, in the first division, which is called meiosis one, the chromosomes are set, the homologous chromosomes are separated. So my diagram there, basically one of these would go to one of the, the cells, this one would go to the other cell. Same, this one would go to one cell and this would go to the other. So we're separating the pairs of homologous chromosomes in the first meiotic division, meiosis one. In the second one, each chromosome is made of a pair of chromatids. So we're pulling the pairs of chromatids apart. We're separating those. So it's the chromatids that are being pulled apart in the second division. So just like in mitosis, we've got prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. In the first meiotic division, it's called prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, and telophase one. You don't need to copy this down because it's in your notes. So that is the first meiotic division. Second meiotic division, we, we then have prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, and obviously you can guess we finish with telophase two. And that's the second meiotic division. So let's, let's start at the beginning. Prophase, prophase one, first stage of meiosis one. So the homologous chromosomes are just in your nucleus. The chromosomes at this point will start to condense and become visible, which is exactly what happened in mitosis, but there's one difference. Homologous chromosomes will pair up. Normally they're just scattered around the nucleus, but they will start to pair up. So I'm gonna draw one pair there, I'm using two different colors, okay? And I'm gonna draw another smaller pair there. And another pair there. Each of those is called a bivalent. So I'm just going to circle that and label it as a bivalent. Okay, so homologous chromosomes pair up to form bivalence. Now, I've only drawn six chromosomes. 
you would have 46 chromosomes. So if six chromosomes with three bivalents there, how many would you have in your cells? Victoria. Well, just said, how many chromosomes would you have? 46. Four, and if they pair up, that's how many? 23. 23, yeah. So your cells would have 23. We're not going to we we'll be there all day drawn. So in this example, we've just got six chromosomes. They pair up. So we've got three bivalents. The other things are the same as prophase in mitosis. So the chromatin condenses. So the chromosomes become visible. And they, each chromosome appears as two chromatids. Where are they joined? What do we call this bit where they're stuck together? I just didn't catch what you said. Centromere. Centromere, yeah. <coughs> okay, so the nucleolus starts to disappear and the nuclear membrane also starts to disappear. It starts to break down and there will be centrioles starting to move to opposite poles of the cell. Okay, so the next stage then, metaphase. So you put cell division here, prophase one. When the bivalents are forming, so a bivalent is two homologous chromosomes. When they line up, quite often they sort of wrap around each other. So they don't just line up straight like I've drawn there. It's then that these bivalents are going to line up at the equator. So I had a big... So I've just got big, medium and small. So each bivalent lines up at the equator. Spindle fibers will attach. And they attach to the centromeres of each chromosome. So anaphase one, same idea. You can probably guess what happens. The spindle fibers start to contract and that will start to pull each chromosome to the opposite pole. So if we draw that, oops. So it's, it's pulling it by the centromere, so that's why it's sort of like a funny shape there. But you can see they're starting to be pulled apart. And it's, it, a chromosome is moving to the right, a chromosome is moving to the left.
So just to clarify, in prophase one, the homologous chromosomes pair up. In metaphase one, these pairs of homologous chromosomes line up at the equator. In anaphase one, the homologous pairs are being separated. So one chromosome will move to one pole, the other moves to the opposite pole. So in the first meiotic division, it's the homologous pairs that are being separated. Now that's different from mitosis. There's no talk of homologous pairs. It was simply pairs of chromatids that were being separated. Whereas the pairs of chromatids are intact. That is a pair of chromatids. It's a chromosome, which is a pair of chromatids. So one chromosome is moving to one pole and the other chromosome is moving to the other. And then telophase, you can probably just guess what happens. Um, they will have moved to the opposite poles. In some cells, the nuclear membrane will start to reform and the chromosomes will decondense and no longer be visible. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes it just goes straight into the next stage. So the chromosomes... Each chromosome consists of a pair of chromatids are pulled towards opposite poles of the cell. Chromosomes decondense, becoming less visible. Nucleolus repairs, nuclear membrane reforms, spindle fibres are broken down and disappear. And then cytokinesis happens. So the cell physically splits in two. And so we end up at the end of the first meiotic division with two daughter cells. So prophase two, if we look at prophase two, so we've now, in this case, well, we've got, I suppose really I should have had four chromosomes there, I only had three. So you can see the, the chromosomes in each cell, visible as parachromatids, they line up at the equator, they get pulled apart. And so you've got just individual chromatids going to the opposite poles and then telophase. That is exactly what happens in mitosis. Okay, but we have to call it, because it's meiosis, it's the second meiotic division, we've got prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, telophase two. All right. So in the first meiotic division, the homologous pairs of chromatids are being separated. In the second division, it's the pairs of chromatids that are being separated. And you end up with cytokinesis. Obviously, these cells would split. You end up with four daughter cells. So you, you can say um, cytokinesis and then you can say four daughter cells. Four daughter cells and they're haploid. Okay, so what, in ways that this is different from mitosis, well, it only happens in ovaries, testes, in animals, in, in plants that will happen in the reproductive organs, like in the, the stamens and the, well, the anthers, which is where the pollen's made, and in the ovules and in the, in the ovaries in the female part of the plant. So just in the reproductive organs... It occurs, it involves two divisions resulting in four daughter cells, whereas mitosis involves one division with two daughter cells.
Now, if we go back and look here, this diagram I've got on the left here, at the end of the first meiotic division, you would have two daughter cells. And the one on the left would have a big red, a tiny blue, and a medium red. The one on the right, the opposite way around. Whenever that, so, so those cells are not identical to each other. Okay? So remember we talked about maybe having blue eyes, the other one might be brown eyes. And so they'll have different genetic information. So they're no longer identical. Whereas in mitosis, all you're doing is you're splitting the chromatids. And remember, one chromatid is genetically identical to the other. And so if you're splitting those, you've got identical copies. So mitosis gives you identical cells. Meiosis gives you four daughter cells, but they're genetically different from each other. And obviously from the parent as well, because the parent cell actually had twice as many chromosomes. And so therefore it can't be identical to that. So meiosis gives us genetic variation in offspring. Sexual reproduction gives us genetically different offspring. And that's actually really good because an organism's main aim is for its species to survive. If you had, um, if you were looking after, if you were a farmer and you had um, a flock of sheep and they're all genetically identical and one of them caught a disease, well, they're all, all likely to catch it then because genetically their immune systems will be the same. So if one catches it, they all catch it, they all get wiped out. If they're genetically different, some will be more resistant to diseases, be more resistant to frost, more resistant to low temperatures, all those kind of things. Some will be obviously less resistant. So some will get sick or if it's plants, some, some will die if there's drought or flooding or whatever. But because there's genetic variation, some will always, usually some will always survive and keep that species, you know, going on. So genetic variation is important for the survival of organisms, for the survival of the species. The chromosomes lining up at the equator, I drew them that way around. They could just as easily have been a different way. So maybe we could have had all red on the left and all blue on the right. Okay, there's a, there's a massive number of different combinations that there could be if you have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Okay, if you've only got six chromosomes, there's a limited number of the arrangements that, that are different. But you have 23 pairs of chromosomes, so there's like millions of different possibilities. And this, this law of independent assortment talks about the fact that these pair line up and they assort themselves in a certain way independently of the next pair and independently of the next pair. So it's, it's totally random. So this in no okay if we look at this next set of diagrams there's a little bit more goes on so talked about their meiosis is essential to keep the chromosome number the same during sexual reproduction because you're joining two cells together so those cells have to have half a set of information but there's different ways in which genetic variation occurs. So, independent assortment. When I was drawing, this is called independent assortment. And the, the, a description is this bit here. So I would highlight this here. The way one pair of homologous chromosomes lines up is totally independent of how any other pair lines up. So what I'm saying is we could have the red on the left and the blue on the right, and then the next pair could be that way around or they could be the other way around. So that's two different possibilities there. So to make this clear, in the, in the photocopy, photocopy, these are colors. So if you color this one in red, and this one in red, or just color them in slightly differently to make them sit out. So 
So obviously the cell on the left has a big black one and a little red one. Cell on the right, it's the other way around. The other possibility is that both red are on the same side and both black are on the same side. So in that case, there's four different combinations that you could have in your gametes. Now, we said earlier that all the gametes are genetically different. Here they're not. Here we've got two that are the same. We've got two of each kind. So there's another thing that happens. We tend to sort of cross over, overlap. They form what's called chiasma, plural is chiasmata. And what happens is they start to swap bits of the chromosomes, break off and attach onto the wrong chromatid and so on. And so they actually swap genetic material over at that point. So if we look at this, it's not terribly clear, but we've got, that's like a big A and a big B there. The other chromatid is identical. So that's going to be a capital A and a capital B. So that could be from the mother. This could have been inherited from the father. And maybe he had different colour of eyes and different colour of hair or whatever the genes might be. So I'm just going to shade this in blue. No, 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 I'll shade it in red because it's the mother. The other one will be blue. All right. So there's the mother's pair of chromatids. And the father's is the sort of the grey one. So we're saying during prophase one, when they come together, there's the mother's one there. What happens is we've got this crossing over. So this chiasma forms. And capital A, capital B. The capital A bit, this bit here, has switched position, it's gone and joined the other chromosome. So you can see that bit at the top has swapped over. So whenever those line up and are separated and then eventually go into four different cells, We've got one that has all red, so capital A, capital B. One that's the mother's up to a certain point, so it has the capital B, but it has the small a. And so we end up with four chromosomes and each of them are, each of them is different from the other ones. Okay, I've just got a couple of words to write and then we're finished. So at the top of that page, this is what's called crossing over. So DNA replicates during the S phase or the synthesis phase of interphase. And the chromosomes appear as pairs of chromatids. During prophase one and that's important homologous chromosome pa chromosomes pair up forming a bivalent and this is what a bivalent looks like but sometimes they sort of get twisted around each other and chiasmata form which is the plural of chiasma
And as a consequence of that, whenever the chromosomes start to pull apart, some parts get swapped over. And that means the chromosomes, the chroma, chromosomes are no longer identical. They're different from each other. They've got different combinations. Look, there's a lot to get your head around there. So go on to Google Classroom. Look at some of the videos I've put up there. All right. They actually.